Hi, welcome to class. My name is Don LaFon, Professor Don, and this week in Cisco One, we are covering Module 16, Network Security Fundamentals. These concepts are very basic. If you've taken a security class in the past, they should be familiar to you. Otherwise, these uh, learning these concepts now will help you in a future security class, I promise. Let me go ahead and share my screen. If you have any questions, uh, while I am uh, giving the presentation and you are live with me, please wait until the end of the presentation to ask your questions. If you are watching this as a recording inside of Netacad, uh, please ask your questions in the help discussion forum. And if you're watching this inside of YouTube, please ask your questions down below in the comments section and I'll do my best to swing by and answer them every now and then. Uh, please also feel free to answer each other other's questions. That builds a great community, and I uh, do enjoy this. I do enjoy seeing that. All right, so let's go ahead and let me get my screen working here. All right, great. And I need some glasses. All right, here we go. Module 16, Network Security Fundamentals. So the objective is to configure switches and routers with device hardening features to enhance security. We are going to learn in this presentation about security threats and vulnerabilities. We'll explain why security measures are necessary uh, in network devices. We'll talk about network attacks and mitigation. We'll identify security vulnerability and mitigation techniques, and we will learn some uh, iOS commands uh, that we're, will help to set up device security uh, by configuring network devices uh, with hardening features to mitigate security threats. Security threats and vulnerabilities. Types of threats. Attacks on a network can be devastating and can result in a loss of time and money due to damage or theft of important information or assets. Intruders can gain access to a network through so software vulnerabilities, hardware attacks through guessing someone's username or password. Intruders who gain access by modifying software or exploiting software are called threat actors. After the threat actor gains access to the network, four types of threats may arise. They may steal information, they may uh, manipulate or, or delete data, they might steal identities, and they are the information that can be used to for identity theft, and they can use or create DOSs, disruption of service, um, uh, or DDOS, and we'll cover that in a little bit. Types of vulnerabilities. Vulnerability is the degree of weakness in a network or security device. Some degree of vulnerability is inherent in router switches, desktop servers, and even security devices themselves. Typically, the network devices under attack are the endpoints, such as a server, a desktop, or, de or your PC. There are a uh, laptop or tablet or whatever. There are three primary vulnerabilities or weaknesses. There's techn technological vulnerabilities, which might include TCP IP protocol weaknesses, operating system weaknesses, and network equipment weaknesses. Then there's configuration vulnerabilities that might include unsecured user accounts, system accounts with easily guessed passwords, mal uh, misconfigured internet services, unsecured default settings, and misconfigured network equipment. Security policy vulnerabilities might include lack of a written security policy, politics, lack of authentication continuity, logical access controls not being applied, software and hardware installation, and changes, uh, installation and changes not following policy, and a non-existent uh, or um, incomplete disaster recovery plan. All three of these sources of vulnerabilities can lead to a network or device open to various attacks, including malicious code attacks uh, and network attacks. Physical security. If networks resources can be physically compromised, a threat actor can deny the use of network resources. The four classes of physical threats are as follows. Hardware threats, these include physical damage to servers, routers, switches, cabling, and workstations. 
Uh, environmental threats, these include temperature extremes, either too hot, too cold, or humidity extremes, too wet or too dry. Electrical threats, these include voltage spikes, Environmental threats, either too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. Electrical threats, these include voltage spikes, insufficient supply voltage, brownouts, uh, unconditioned, uh, unconditioned power, noise, or total power loss. Uh, maintenance threats, this includes power handling of key electrical components, elect such as electrostatic discharge, uh, that's when you handle uh, components which are bare hand without being um, properly grounded, uh, lack of critical spare parts, poor cabling, and poor labeling. A good plan for physical super security must be created and implemented to address these issues. Address these issues. Okay. Network attacks. Types of malware. Malware is short for malicious software. It is code or software specifically des designed to damage, disrupt, steal, or inflict bad or illegitimate action on data hosts and networks. The following types of the following are types of malware. Viruses. A virus, a computer virus, is a type of malware that propagates by inserting a copy of itself into and becoming part of another program. It spreads from one computer to another, leaving infections as it travels. Worms are similar to viruses in that they replicate, the replicate, they replicate themselves uh, and can cause the same type of damage. In contrast to viruses, which require the spreading of infected host files, what the difference with worms are is they're standalone software and they do not require a host program or human to propagate through a system, a network. Trojan horses, it is a harmful, Trojans are harmful pieces of software that look legitimate. Unlike viruses and worms, Trojan horses do not reproduce or, or by infecting other files. They self-replicate um, by, uh, Trojan horses must spread through user interaction, such as opening an email attachment or downloading and running a file from the internet, or some, sometimes as simple as, uh, clicking on a link and then it looks legitimate. You enter your sign, your sign in and password, and then it doesn't go anywhere. Well, ultimately, you just clicked on a Trojan. You just gave somebody your password. That's immediately sent to whoever uh, it created the Trojan, and now they have your sign in and password. It could be as something as simple as that. Now, the reading of this video is way too fast for me to do it, so I'm just going to let it go. The first one. We talk about worms, viruses, and Trojan horses. All right. Now, the beauty of a recording is you can pause the recording I, uh, to read those screens. Um, I can't pause it on my end. So if that went a little bit too fast for you, just hit pause, read what it says, and then under, it basically says the same thing I, I read to you on the screen before. Okay, reconnaissance attacks. In addition to malicious code attacks, it is also possible for networks to fall prey to various network, network attacks. Network attacks can be classified into three major categories. Reconnaissance attacks, that's just when somebody is looking to discover and map the system services or vulnerabilities, basically reaching out and seeing what's available, doing some reconnaissance. Then there's access attacks. That's the unauthorized manipulation of data systems access or other privileges. And then there's denial of service. That's the disabling or corruption of network systems and services. And I have a couple of slides to show that. 
For reconnaissance attacks, external threat actors can use internal to tools, such as the NS lookup and who is utility, to easily determine the IP address space assigned to a given corporation or entity. After the IP address space is determined, a threat actor can then ping the publicly available IP address to identify the acts, uh, if the act addresses are active, and then there are tools to determine what the range of addresses are. Uh, so these addresses are available just by going to whois.net, for example. You type in your uh, the uh, domain name, and it tells you who registered the, that domain name. So uh, the um, in this case, they're putting cisco.com uh, into whois.net, and they, they're returning who registered the, the, the that domain uh, and the address, the IP address, and how long uh, its registration is valid. And that's public knowledge. That's you can do that for any uh, domain that's, uh, that you want to find out information about. Access attacks. Access attacks exploit known vulnerabilities in authentication servers, services, FTP services, and web services to gain act, entry to web accounts, confidential databases, and other sensitive information. Attacks can be classified into four types. There are password attacks, they're implemented using brute force, a Trojan horse, or a packet sniffer, basically somebody looking for telnet data or data that it just generally is not secured. Trust exploitation. That's when a threat actor uses unauthorized, unauthorized privileges to gain access to a system, possibly compromising the target. Then there's port re redirection. That's when a threat actor uses a compromised system as a base for attacks against other targets. For example, a threat actor using SSH port 22 to connect to a compromised host A. Host A is trusted by host B, and therefore the threat actor can use tel Telnet port 23 to access it. Then there's man in the middle. The threat actor is positioned in between two legitimate entities in order to read and modify the data that passes between the two parties. Denial of service attacks. Denial of service attacks, DOS attacks, are the most publicized form of attack and the, among the most difficult to eliminate. However, because of their ease of implementation and potentially significant damage, DOS attacks deserve special attention from security administrators. DOS attacks take many forms. Ultimately, they prevent authorized people like you and me from, at, from using a service by consuming system resources. To help prevent DOS attacks, it is important to stay up to date with the latest security updates for operating systems and applications. DOS attacks, DOS attacks, are a major risk because they interrupt communication and cause significant loss of time and money. These attacks are relatively simple to connect, conduct by an unskilled threat, even by an unskilled threat actor. So you are going to be doing a lab where you're going to go to the SANS website, S-A-N-S website. And on that SANS website, you're gonna look for some type of recent security breach and there's always a DOS attack. Matter of fact, it's in the news when a company like Google or Net um, or um, Net um, uh, Google or YouTube or um, any server goes down because of a DOS attack, uh, then you often hear about it in the news because people want to know why they were were not able to get to their bank and they find out it was because somebody was doing a denial of service attack. Now there's also a, let me, let me um, zoom in on this video just so you can see it uh, in case you were not able to, to see what was going on. Oh, oh, I can't do that. Okay, I can't zoom in. Uh, so you can see here, uh, one threat actor uh, is just pinging uh, the uh, server and then the server is so busy with these pings that valid traffic uh, is not able to to um, reach the server and have the server respond to that that data or that traffic. All right. Uh, now, a denial of service attack could be a DDoS, which is similar to a DOS attack. 
but it originates from multiple coordinating so uh, sources called zombies. A threat actor builds a network of infected hosts, these zombies, uh, and uh, a network of zombies, which is called a botnet. The threat actor then uses a command to initiate the attack uh, through a control CNC program and instructs the botnet of zombies to carry out the DDoS attack. So here, uh, the first thing the threat actor does is it uh, infects other computers. Then you don't even know your computer uh, is compromised. Uh, when the threat actor then activates the botnet, then those you know thousands of computers conceivably can all can all bombard a service uh, with uh, uh, requests for information and uh, uh, packets, requests for packets, and ultimately overloading that packet, and then it gets overloaded, and then it cannot uh, respond to legitimate traffic that is being requested by uh, non-zombies. You're going to do a lab, as I mentioned a moment ago, you're going to explore the SAMS website. It's an awesome website uh, that you should absolutely uh, sign up to get their weekly security update so that you can keep abreast of the uh, security uh, threats and the mitigation techniques uh, that you will be using uh, now in class, in school, and learning about, and then later when you're actually in a production network. Okay, network attack mitigation. What do we do to block all of those threats? Uh, the defense in depth approach allows us to uh, apply, apply a layered approach of multiple um, security. Uh, this combination of network devices and services work in tandem. In this case, several security devices uh, and servers that we'll cover over the next few slides uh, are uh, protecting organizations, user, and assets against threats. Uh, these uh, threat actors. So we have a VPN that just secures all the traffic that goes out there. We have firewalls uh, that are their own device, an ASA firewall. Um, instead of having a firewall on a uh, piece of equipment, you have it on the network. Uh, we have an intrusion protection uh, uh, system, IPS, uh, that actually is looking for the bad guy attack, attacking our network. Uh, we have uh, AAA server that we cover in a couple of slides, basically authenticating, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll cover it in a minute, um, um, authorizing uh, and accounting for actions that happen. And then we have an ES, uh, ESA, WSA, uh, that is uh, also monitoring traffic that's on our network uh, and uh, blocking the traffic that's not wanted. For example, uh, people going uh, to uh, video movie websites to watch movies during working hours, right? They can, all of that can be blocked using one of these devices. Um, keeping backups. Keeping backups is a critical element in any security policy. Uh, backup device configuration and data uh, is effective in protecting against data loss. Uh, it can be inconvenient. Uh, for example, recently there was some, there was some, um, uh, attacks where uh, companies, I think it was a um, an oil pipeline, its data was all it was encrypted, uh, and the, the company had to pay five billion dollars in was it million? I think it was million five million dollars uh, ransom uh, to to get the key to unencrypt. Well, if you have a good backup of the data, you don't need you can just delete the data that's been. Um, that's been corrupted and you can just put the good data in its place. So backup should be performed on a regular basis to protect against those type of attacks. Data backups are usually stored offsite to protect the backup media if anything happened to the main facility, such as a hurricane or a fire, tornado. Uh, the table shows backup consideration and the description. So the frequency, how often do you do it? So. Uh, you could or should back up based on your business requirements. Uh, in a, um, for example, in a uh, in a company like Walmart or Amazon, it's important to have instantaneous backups of every transaction that happens, so that uh, you don't lose any transactions. Right? We don't want to be responsible for lost sales, so it has to be backed up immediately. 
Um, if uh, it could also be backed up at night. So some businesses, maybe a school, for example, uh, could do their backups uh, in the evening at two o'clock in off peak times. Now that backup could be a full backup, uh, but those can be very time consuming. Uh, therefore, uh, monthly or weekly backups are usually uh, made with partial backups uh, more frequent, like a, a every night and maybe once a week on Saturday night, Sunday night, you do the full backup. Now, storage, always validate the backup to ensure that the integrity of the data and that you are able to actually restore it. Um, at one point, I was backing up to a tape backup that was at least 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and today, it's not unusual for businesses to, to do, do tape backup, believe it or not, because they're easy to record and then they are easy to transport to a, an off-campus off, um, location uh, for safe storage in case of fire or hurricane or flooding or whatever. So uh, that, those tape backups, make sure that you are able to actually take the backup and then restore the data. Uh, do it in a in a train in a training or a test environment to make sure that the way you're backing it up, uh, you're actually able to use the data if you ever need it. I was backing up data back in the day when I was using a tape backup, uh, but the one time I actually needed to restore the data, it wouldn't restore. I was doing something wrong with the backup, and all of that time I was backing up data, it wasn't really backing it up properly, or at least not in a way I could actually restore the data. Security. Backup should be transported to an approved off-site storage location on a daily, weekly, or monthly rotation as required by security policy. Again, based on uh, the, um, the, the mid, uh, based on the risk of where your company is uh, and uh, the, the dangers your company has. So fire is always a risk, um, but, uh, but you have to um, do a risk um, evaluation to determine how often to send backups or create backups. Actually, in today's world, uh, backing up can be backed up to the cloud uh, that's the safest um, as long as you have um, all your security measures in place for cloud storage. Uh, if you can back up to the cloud, uh, then that kind of eliminates the need to send tape or hard drive or CD or however else you're backing it up. Physical uh, data uh, send because you have a uh, cloud storage device uh, that is backing up your data. Um, now, I also want to mention um, the dangers of uh, the electrical dangers of backups as well. So sometimes people say, well, I have two hard drives on my computer and it backs up automatically. They're, they're mirrored. What is that? A, a RAID 1, I believe, is mirroring. I'm not positive. Don't hold me to that, but I think it's RAID 1. Uh, but anyways, that's mirroring. Uh, but what happens if you, you'll, you'll, your um, computer gets hit by it gets hit by lightning and both hard drives fry, get fried. Um, I personally have an NAS um, cabinet, uh, but I leave it connected all the time. So great. So again, the power, power electric, um, lightning is pretty powerful. It can easily go through my computer, through the cable into my uh, NAS cabinet and, fry, and erase all my backups. So um, you have to be smart and you really have to think out your security policy of what is the best location, storage, frequency, and security. And of course, va validation. You have to make sure you use strong pa passwords for your backups. Otherwise, if somebody accesses your, your backup, uh, they have all your data. It's as if they um, accessed your live um, production network. Uh, upgrade, update, and patch. Uh, they talk here about Windows, just making sure that Windows uh, updates on a regular basis. You could update uh, in the evening. You could update, uh, where you make sure that uh, when do you want all of the vendor patches and vulnerabilities to be patched, uh, vendor updates and vulnerabilities to be patched. Um, that is a critical thought process as well on all of your um, client computers. Uh, one source of management of critical security patches is to make sure all end systems are automatically downloaded with updates and that can be centrally coordinated. Authentication, authorization, and accounting, AAA, if this is the first time you've seen it, uh, it's a lot like your credit card. Uh, in order to, you have a credit card, that credit card has a limit, and then there's a recording of all of the transactions. Uh, the, 
the physical, who you are, is that credit card in hand? You have to swipe the card today. You have to insert the chip. And that proves that you actually have the card and it's who you are. You have the password once you insert the, the card. Uh, then there's authorization. How much can you spend? That is um, uh, the authorized. What are you authorized to spend? And then there's a record of all of your purchase. That's accounting. And that is uh, that shows all of the charges that you've made. Well, the same thing is true in a network environment. You uh, do you have the right sign in uh, user? Excuse me, username and password. Do you have uh, once you get into the network? Where are you authorized to go? What can, are you authorized to see and do on the network? And then accounting. There is somebody recording all this. This, this there is a net, there is a system involved. Uh, an impl implementer should be at least uh, to to show what every command is that everybody's done. That way, if there's a problem, even if it's not intentional, what if there's a problem? Somebody goes in and accidentally types the wrong command, it brings the whole network down. Well, then you can actually go backwards and you can see in time what actually happened on that server or on the network before the network went down, and you can see the error perhaps that was made, and then you can easily correct that error and bring it back up again. If somebody does something bad, uh, then uh, you can go back again and see what uh, was done by who, uh, because they had to authenticate to get into the network. So what they did is recorded. Now I talk about firewalls. Network firewalls reside between two or more networks. Uh, they control the traffic between them and help prevent unauthorized access. In the simple network up here, uh, we have a firewall in between the inside network and the outside. Now that it can be a device or it can be software. Obviously a device made for that purpose is generally preferred. Now, uh, if some bad traffic tries to get into the network uh, that has not been requested, uh, then it can be blocked. Um, and that we we get more into that uh, in Cisco too. Um, now you can also set up a DMZ. Uh, that's a demilitarized zone. Can be known as a demilitarized zone, uh, and it enables network administrators to apply specific policies for hosts connected to that network. Basically, what you can do is you can set up a, a servers that are in this zone that can that you can access from the outside, but yet that um, outside access never gets inside your network. Uh, sometimes your uh, inside network also has to reach the server to be able to get to the outside network. Um, that is um, something uh, that can add to the security level of your firm. Types of firewalls. Firewall products come in packaged in a, ver in a variety of forms. These products use different techniques for determining what will be permitted or denied access to a network. Um, they include the following. We can packet filter. That prevents or allows access based on IP or MAC address. Who can actually get in or out of the network? We can use application filtering. Uh, that prevents or allows access to a specific, specific application like Netflix. That was that program I was thinking about earlier that I couldn't remember. Uh, but Netflix, you can block Netflix uh, from people being able to get to it. That way, uh, the people aren't running, um, uh, you know, a, a movie software on your work computer when they should be doing um, work, right? Uh, it could be URL filtering, prevent or allow access to websites, uh, say to YouTube, for example. If you want to block YouTube, you can do that, or other uh, bad websites for one reason or another that your, your work site doesn't want you to access. Maybe the competitor. I don't know. Uh, state for, stateful packet inspection, SPI. Incoming packets must be legitimate responses to requests from internal hosts. Unsolicited packets are blocked unless permitted specifically. SPI, stateful packet inspection, can also include the capability to recognize the fill and filter out specific types of attacks, such as denial of service attacks. And again, that's what's going on over here. Uh, we have um, denial based on if you didn't request the data, then it's not going to be replied, uh, not going to be able to reach the in time network, inside network. Endpoint security. An endpoint or host is an individual computer system or device that acts as a network client. Common endpoints include laptops, desktops, servers, smartphones, and tablets. 
Securing endpoint devices is one of the most challenging jobs of a network administrator because it involves human nature. A company must have well-documented policies in place and employees must be aware of these rules. Employees need to be trained on proper use of the network. Policies often include the use of antivirus software and host intrusion prevention. More comprehensive endpoint security solutions rely on network access control. I know that um, recently, my uh, one of the schools that I teach for uh, has started intentionally sending phishing email to us uh, just to see if we're clicking on it uh, and um, if we forward it on uh, to the uh there's a um, fish at i don't know the name of the com uh, the college uh yeah uh, um fish think i think is the email. fish think at the email basically reporting something and if you report the email uh that that is phishing to them uh then you get uh i don't know a pat on the back or something uh, but uh, if you click on it and you open it then you get uh a um chastised in a reply email saying that was phishing uh you should not have clicked on the link so basically they're testing uh the intelligence level of the uh, employees at the college device security cisco auto secure the security settings are set to the default values when a new operating system is installed on a device in most cases, this level of security is inadequate. For Cisco routers, the Cisco Auto Secure feature can be used to assist securing the system. In addition, there are several simple steps that should be taken that apply to most operating systems. Default usernames and passwords should be changed immediately. Access to system resources should be restricted to only the individuals that are authorized to use the resources. Any unnecessary services and applications should be turned off and uninstalled when possible. Often, devices shipped from a manufacturer have been sitting in a warehouse for a period of time and do not have the most up-to-date patches installed. It is important to update any software and install any security patches prior to implementation of the piece of equipment. Passwords. To protect network devices, it is important to use strong passwords. Here are standard guidelines to follow. Use a password length or at least eight characters, preferably 10 or more, and I've heard 12 uh, or more is ideal. Make passwords complex, including a mix of uppercase and lowercase, number symbols and spaces if allowed. Avoid passwords based on repetition, one, two, three, four, five, six common dictionary words, or even a combination of common dictionary words, letters or numbered sequences, username, uh, usernames, uh, using your username as your password is a big no-no, uh, relative or pet, pet names, uh, which is my favorite uh, because half of you right now are thinking, yep, I use my pet name, uh, I better change that. Biographical information such as birth dates, ID numbers, ancestor names, and other easily identified pieces of information, such as your social security number. Hmm, don't do that. Deliberately misspell a password. For example, Smith could be spelled uh, S-M-Y-T-H or 5-M-Y-T-H, or security could be misspelled 5-E-C-U-R-1-T-Y. Easy enough to remember, but not easy to, uh, to figure out. Change passwords often. If a password is unknowingly compromised, the window of opportunity for the threat actor to use the password is limited. Do not write your password down and put it under your keyboard or any other obvious place, such as a desk or monitor. I remember when that was the place to find passwords, but back in those days, security wasn't as big a deal as they are today. On Cisco routers, leading spaces are ignored for passwords, but spaces after the first characters are not. Therefore, one method to calculate or create a strong password is to use the space bar and create a phrase made of many words. This is called a passphrase. passphrase. A passphrase is often easier to remember than a simple password. It is also longer and harder to guess. 
So Microsoft has had a website at one point and they were trying to teach how to use passphrases. And the phrase they use is my son Aiden is five years old. And then what they did was they said, take my son Aiden is five years old and then add uh, um, um, symbols and numbers in the place of some of those things. So, um, or I misspelled. So you could type my M I and you could you could say son S zero N uh, Aiden uh, could be spelled eight D E N. You get the idea, right? So once you figure out that, then they would shrink it back down again. Uh, so then all you would have to remember is uh, M uh, uh, S, which could be a dollar sign, A, uh, which could be an eight. And all of a sudden, a passphrase becomes an eight character password. But in Cisco, you can leave it the whole passphrase with a couple of intentional misspellings. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, it would be a challenge for anybody to guess a password like that. Um, and then you can update it uh, monthly uh, if it asks you to um, do a month and uh, change your password every three months. You can you can do my son Aiden is fifteen uh, is fifteen months old, and then the next time is eighteen months old, and is twenty one months old, and you'd have to remember it. But it would be a good way to remember how old your son Aiden is. All right. Anyways, enough on the, enough of passwords. Addition, additional password security. There are several steps that can be taken to help ensure that passwords remain secret on a Cisco router and switch. And they include encrypting all play, plain text passwords with the service password encryption command. You can also set a minimum pass, acceptable password length with the security passwords min length command. You can deter brute force password guessing uh, attacks with the login block for number attempts number within number command. And you can also disable inactive passwords, privilege exec password access after a specific amount of time with the exec timeout and then minutes and seconds. So let's take a look at the actual command in action. Uh, so service password encryption encrypts all of your um, unencrypted passwords. Uh, such as lo uh, your VTY logins and your console um, passwords, VTY passwords. And then security password, this is the command min length at eight, and that sets it to a minimal cap um, length of eight characters. And then lock, login block for 120 seconds, which is two minutes, uh, but don't put two in there, put 120 seconds, uh, attempts, um, uh, block for 120 after three attempts are incorrect within 60 seconds. So it's uh, block for 120. If you wanted to make it four minutes, it would be 240. Uh, if you want to make it five attempts, it would be attempts five. And then within 60, maybe you set that to 30. I don't know. Uh, that would definitely help block, but that's how those numbers change. Then line VTY uh, uh, 04, that only enables five VTY lines. That in itself is a slight security feature. There's no reason to have 16 VTY lines. So only a, a, um, enable the maximum number of virtual lines you think you'll have people signing into your network. Uh, password Cisco, except timeout, timeout five space 30. So after five minutes and 30 seconds, the uh, after signing into VTY, it will automatically uh, um, disconnect you. Uh, and that's good because without the 530 uh, exec timeout, somebody, you could be with a, um, a tech support person working on a problem, and then you could say, okay, and everybody says goodbye, but that person could not, he, maybe he doesn't log out. Uh, and uh, then he's continuous logged in. And then, you know, a few minutes later, a few, maybe an hour, two hours later, he's still connected to your network. He could just go in and do bad things. Hopefully um, your your security, the people you're calling for help aren't trying to break into your network, but this is a way uh, to stop people from signing in or to force them to sign out. Another thing is you could log in on the other side and then walk away from their computer and then some bad guy, threat actor, sits out at the computer and sees an open connection to your network and then that bad guy uses a connect connection to connect to your network. 
and then forcing SSH. We're going to learn on the next slide about enabling SSH, but here it just says transport input SSH. Now, if you don't use the transport, transport command, you're not going to be able to telnet or SSH into the network. If you add telnet in there, uh, then people will be able to telnet into your network uh, over an unsecured line. So if you have a packet sniffer out in the hallway or in the driveway, uh, then somebody will be able to see the unencrypted text. Uh, so you want to enable just SSH in most cases, and then end to exit out of that. Now you can see to ensure you have entered the right information, you can go do show running configuration, and then you could pipe to section line line VTY and it jumps down to the VTY uh, passwords. And you can see instead of showing a plain text password for the VTY lines, it now has a, a hash in there instead. And then the executive timeout is labeled uh, um, enabled and uh, login says you're going to lose use a local authentication server. Now uh, in Cisco 2, we learn how to use a um, uh, a um, authentication server that's out on the network uh, using um, what is, uh, a radius server, and but that's in Cisco two out. Wait till next semester and you can get that training from me as well. All right, so oh you can look it up. <clears throat> now enabling SSH, uh, it is possible to configure a device to support secure SSH. Uh, using the following steps. First, you have to use, you have to create a unique de device host name so they can't all be named R1. Uh, then configure an IP domain name. What that domain name is doesn't matter. You just have to use the IP domain name and then give it a name. That domain name, whatever you give it, is used to create the, the, uh, the hash, um, the, um, the security, uh, the number of bits. I'll show you in the next line. Uh, the command to enable or generate a key uh, is key generate, I'm sorry, crypto key generate RSA, um, general keys, mod modulus, and then the number of bits. Now, the uh, minimum recommended modulus length is 1024 at this point, uh, but uh, you um, you can go up to 2048 or as low as 360, which is not recommended. Pretty easy to break uh, if it's under 512. Pretty easy to break at 512. So anyway, so um, the, I'll show you the command on the next page. But it, uh, but this is this is really an easy command. All you got to do is remember crypto. If you can remember crypto when it comes to SSH, then you are fine because you type crypto question mark key question mark generate rsa uh question mark um actually in packet tracer uh, you can't i believe you can't type out the whole command uh, including the, the mod modulus you have to uh, uh have that you have to hit enter after rsa and then you it asks you what modulus and then you type in 1024. Don't hold me to that, but it seems to me the last time I did a packet tracer, I've, I've had students indicate that if they type this out, because that's what they put in their notes, it doesn't work. It's because this part of the command, you don't actually type. Now in a production network in the actual iOS on actual routers, you can write it just like this. Then verify or create local database entry, create a local database using uh, the entry uh, the entry using username so that's where in the assignments you're going to be doing username cisco password class uh, remember now you can have lots of different usernames so it could be username tom password abc username barbara uh, password 456 right so you can create individual usernames um, uh, then authenticate against a local database using the login local uh, line configuration command and then enable VTY inbound SSH only SSH. Uh, the command is transport input SSH or Telnet, uh, but they recommend only using SSH because again, Telnet is unsecure and anybody can sno uh, snoop on that information. Then disable unused services. So if Cisco routers and switches start with a list of active services, 
that may or may not be required in your network, disable any unused services to prevent system resources such as CPU cycles and RAM, and to prevent threat actors from exploding, exploding, exploiting these services. The type of services that are on, a, on by default will vary based on the iOS. For example, iOS XE typically ha uh, will have only HTTPS and DHCP ports open. You can verify this with the show IP ports all command. Now, if you are prior to iOS XE, you need to use the show control plane host open ports command. I'm thinking, I'm thankful that we are on um, iOS 15 and we don't have to remember this long command. It, but when you're out in the in the uh, on a production network, you may have older networks and older software, so you might need that command as well. You're going to do a packet tracer where you're going to configure secure passwords and a lab where you're going to configure network devices with SSH. Then you are going to secure network devices with the packet tracer and with the real equipment as well. And then that leaves us for questions. So that is the end of our presentation. Um, if you have any questions and you're here with me live, just hang out. Again, uh, hold on for a moment if you're with me live. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate, this is a basic introduction on security. In uh, Cisco 2, we build on all of these concepts that I just taught in your security class, which hopefully you take before you take Cisco 2, or at least you take it at the same time. In that security class, you're going to build on all of these concepts. Um, if you've already taken it, then all these concepts are already familiar to you, except for the iOS commands. So uh, this week won't be a very challenging week for you uh, if you already have had security, uh, but uh, it will be uh, an interesting week to review these concepts. And if you haven't had security, uh, then you will uh, learn these concepts. Remember, there's a whole uh, there's a whole uh, individual test just on security uh, in Cisco. You can make a career just on security in Cisco, uh, being the guy that's re responsible for security. You can make a lot of money in Cisco uh, and get paid for that um, that additional. Uh, level of certification. So I encourage you to take this seriously and uh, learn as much as you can. It'll be important when you get out to the fleet. The fleet when you get out to the uh, to your job, and you are able to um, to uh, recognize and implement proper security. All right. My name is Don Lafon, Professor Don. It's been my pleasure uh, to help you learn th these concepts today. Uh, if you have any questions. I want you uh, to ask your questions uh, with me in just a moment if you are live. If you are watching this as a recording inside of Netacad, please uh, add your question to the help discussion forum and your fellow students and I will answer or help to answer those questions. If you're watching this on YouTube, please ask questions in the comment section below. Uh, I also appreciate any recommendations for improvement and I also appreciate it when you like and subscribe to my channel. That helps me out and I do appreciate that. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you for coming to class and I'll have a great week learning Cisco and I'll see you next week. Next week.